Hey, this is Ernest Rolfson, the CEO and founder of Finexio. Welcome to B2B Cashflow Conversations, the podcast dedicated to sharing insights and innovations in business to business payments, working capital and cash flow management, and fintech entrepreneurship. In each episode, my guest and I tackle questions in the ever evolving world of fintech and payments, an industry that's rapidly evolving and of great interest to investors and businesses alike. Looking forward to having this conversation. So, hey, today I'm talking with Caleb Avery, the CEO and founder of Tilled, uh, a payfac as a service company enabling software firms to become their own payment facilitators. Caleb's been in the payments industry for nearly 10 years and has founded another company prior to Tilled in the payments industry uh, while he's still in college, which is pretty neat. So, uh, dude, great to meet you uh, again, uh, or re-meet you, I should say. <laughs> um, nice to see. I know that you have not changed the backsplash in your kitchen since we talked. So yeah, that's you gotta have the, the downstairs bar ready. So I've got the, the cigars and the cocktail that, machine. Oh, that's okay. It's not that. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, the next, once, uh, once we sell our companies, we can, we can start, uh, the drunken podcast, which may be more <laughs> interesting to others. We don't have to, you know do this, uh, do this grind here every day, but, uh, that's great. You're at the ready. You're beating me. Um, I, I am. So- it's, it's only nine 30 in the, in the morning, but I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> so how, got so your coffee. I do have my coffee. Yes. Um, so how did, uh, how, so why don't you tell me more about how you did get started, uh, in the, in the space here? Yeah. So I got started in the payment space by co-founding a credit card processing ISO, while I was still in college. So between my sophomore and junior year of, of college, I kind of had this, this idea where did I want to apply for internships or did I want to try and go out and you know work for myself? And the, the latter seemed much more appealing. And so my partner and I started by just going door to door, talking with small business owners in the Greenville, South Carolina area. And you know, surprisingly, they were willing to talk to us uh, and trust us with their their payment processing services. And so it really started out with us just going out with the idea of like, hey, if we could save these guys money and offer them a better solution, would they be open to to talking with us? And you know that has has really exploded since you know founding that back in in college. You know at this point we're processing billions of dollars a year in payments. You know through that that ISO, uh, but started out with you know very humble roots, just going door to door talking with these small business owners. Nice. What what um. Uh, well, I guess, did you then eventually evolve into larger companies to be able to get into that bill, the billion zone? How did we that, did. how so, did that kind of transition happen? You know, we built up a, a sales force of about 120, uh, agents that have been going door to door, but as time went on, we started getting, these are, 10 in 90s. These are all 1099 style. Correct. Yeah. 1099 agents, uh, in 22 States across the, the country. But we started getting brought in on these consulting projects with larger software companies, anywhere between about 100 million up to about a billion dollars a year in annual payments volume. And oftentimes we were brought in by like the fractional CFOs of these businesses who were trying to make sense of essentially the the credit card processing statements to to start with. And so, you know, historically credit card processing statements are, are made to be this, you know, complicated, you know, obfuscated thing where unless you have the expertise and you've looked at thousands of these statements, they're intentionally designed to be, you know, difficult to read. And so these these fractional CFOs would bring us in to say, like, you know, hey guys, can you help us figure out what's going on? Like what are we paying? How much, you know, oh are, are, are this positioned you as as the good guys to help understand and navigate this and save some of these people money. Is that was that is that the way this is sold in the past? Yeah, for sure. So for a lot of the the smaller software companies that were, you know, 100, 200 million in annual payments volume that are using Stripe or, or Braintree, when they're on that flat rate pricing model of, you know, 2.9% and 30 cents or, you know, 2.75%. Take all my money. Cents, yeah, they really have no idea if that's a reasonable rate. And so they're basically calling and saying like, hey, am I getting a good deal? You know, I went through this negotiation process, you know, with Stripe and I got them down from 2.9% and 30 cents to, 2.7% and, and 25 cents. And they're like, how did I do? Because I have no idea. There's no transparency with that that flat rate pricing model because you have no idea what the underlying interchange costs are from the, the yeah. card brands. And so, you know, having looked at thousands of these statements and, 
you know, knowing in these different industries what the interchange cost should be, we were able to tell them like, actually, you know, sorry, the, the cost is probably more like 2% or, you know, 2.1%. And so Stripe is making a lot of money, you know, off of you guys, if you're processing 100, $200 million a year in, in payments. And so they would really look to us to help them figure out, you know, how to actually, you know, monetize these, these payments and, and stop, you know, giving away all this revenue to, to Stripe and Square and Braintree. These are your, when you're having this conversation, you're talking about the end user corporates themselves, right? You're talking about some kind of large retailer, some kind of large e-commerce company at this point. You're still talking about some of these. It was more like right. B2B to C software companies. Mm-hmm. So think right. dental software company that's selling a software, a SaaS service to a dentist who has yeah. an end consumer or patient that's paying them money. And so, you know, as an example, the dental software company is collecting $100 million in payments across 700 dentists that have, you know, all of their downstream customers, they're paying them, you know, for their services. And oftentimes, these dental software businesses were just passing along the 2.9% and 30 cents or the 2.7% and 20 cents from Stripe or Braintree onto the dentist. And so for the the software company, there's just no revenue. For them, they're just like taking this unreasonable right. price <laughs> and passing along to their customers. Passing it along, and then there's no they revenue don't know for any them. better. They really don't. Um, and you know the reason why a lot of these software companies start out picking you know the Stripe or the Braintree is because it's easy to get up and running. And so you know when they're designing this the software system, payments is kind of a portion of of what they're building, but it's not the core of the business. You know the core of the business is the dental software. Uh, you know, it's the scheduling tool. It's all of those aspects that are custom for for that industry. It's the critical infrastructure that the companies need to use the software, and then payments is a one little module. But they haven't figured out how to monetize the payments. Yeah, and it's not a big deal in the beginning. You know, when you've got one dentist on the platform, you're not leaving very much money on the table. But all of a sudden, when you've got you know three hundred, five hundred, a thousand dentists, you know, on the platform, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And I think as these software companies start to scale, they start to realize, you know, you know, this, this is a lot of money, you know, that I'm paying to whether it's Stripe or Braintree or Square or whoever their processor is, you know, it's a lot of money that's, that's kind of flowing through the system. And when they're not seeing any of that revenue, it, it kind of starts to, to give them pause. And I think that's why, you know, a lot of times it was these fractional CFOs that were bringing us in because they were looking at the, the, the PL and saying like, you know, hey guys, why are we not making any money off of, you know, a hundred million dollars that's flowing through the the software system? And so that's where we would come in. Got it. Got it. So you started then specifically targeting the software companies. We did. And and really where the the idea from from Tilled, you know, came into play, one of these clients in particular was processing about a billion dollars a year in payments. And so they had already figured out how to, to monetize their payments. They had a couple of different processes with it, with the Stripe or with like a Stripe or a Braintree or a, someone so else. So they had started thesis. with Stripe or Braintree like eight years back, and then they had transitioned to the okay. point where they were referring business to you know the Tesis's and First Data's and the big processors of the world. And so they were generating millions of dollars on their payments. The problem was the onboarding experience was pretty brutal. So you know they spent all this money building oh, out. Forget this about it. It's a nineteen. 19- and then Forget they're asking customers. They had, so they had yeah. so you're what you're saying the software so the software company was building the front end and building the funnel but then it comes to the credit card processing and you're back in 1995 right filling out a form right Yeah they're like hey here's first data's PDF uh you know can you fill out this four page PDF and we're going to need you know a driver's license and a voided check and 3 months of processing We're going to need the voided the voided check. There's no other way to check if the bank account is real or not. You need no, a physical voided not. check. Yep. <laughs> uh, and you might even have to Epic. fax us the uh, the voided check. Well, no, fax is pre- fax is preferred. <laughs> it is. Fax it's is the, absolutely the preferred because we have to keep we have to keep the fax operator employed. <laughs> it, right. It's like we still have the. If you go to the first data office in Atlanta, you'll see they still have an elevator operator. They'll press the buttons for you because they got to keep them keep them with a job. And then the you know, top top all that off, you've got to wait you know a week to get your your merchant account approved, and it's just this process. At least that, a week. 
yeah, that, that, as you say, is, you know, decades behind, whereas, you know, you go on to Stripe's website or Square's website and you fill out this beautiful, you know, digital onboarding form and three minutes later you right. click submit and then you're instantly able to start processing payments. And it's just this, it's just this totally different experience than, you know, Hey, here's a PDF and we're going to need all these attachments and like, yeah, give us a week or two, you know, to get your, your account approved. And so, you know, for, uh, this client that that we were working with, they really wanted to understand what it would take for them to become a fully registered payment facilitator. And so that that payment facilitator or payback model is really the basis for you know Stripe and Square and Braintree and PayPal and all all of these guys that you know you historically think of as having this beautiful onboarding experience. It's really based on this concept of becoming you know a fully registered payment facilitator. But historically, that was a, a two-year, you know, multi-million-dollar process to become a fully registered payment facilitator, where you've got to go through the process of, you know, negotiating with a bank and a processor, and it's it's just a terrible, you know, expensive experience. That and and that, but that this is like circa what, like six years now, more than six years ago. This is like ten years ago now, right? That the, that that the right? payback model kind of came that, into into existence. Yeah, yeah, and it was this this kind of insane and onerous and impossible. Yeah, right. And so that, yeah. you know, it's it's been around for for well over you know a decade now, but there there still haven't been that many companies that have been able to take advantage of this model just because of how time consuming, and expensive you know it was to to become a payback. And about three years ago, when I was doing this consulting work, work was right as Companies like Finex and Finicept, you know, Payrix, Amaryllis, a lot of these pay back in a box providers were coming online with their their models. And these pay back in a box solutions took the, you know, two year multi million dollar process to become a pay back. And they've made it like a six month, couple hundred thousand dollar process to become a pay back. The problem is it's still six months. You're still sounds having like, to hire a team of people. Sounds like six months. Sounds like a consulting business to me. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, Eerily like a, a consulting business where you you get to hire them for you know seventy five k or something in, in upfront consulting fees and they work with you through this six month process to convince you know a bank and a processor you know that you're able to you know approve these merchants and they have to design you know policies and procedures and hire personnel um, and and integrate all of these systems and it, and it's complicated uh, you know to to get all of that in place. And so, you know, when I explained to, to my consulting client, what it would actually look like for them to, to go get, you know, registered as a pay fact, they, they concluded in like 15 minutes, like, there's no way we're, we're going to go down this path. Uh, it was just far too no. much time and money and, and effort and risk, you know, for, for them to take on. Yeah, it's not a good, it's not a good business plan. So um, I guess this is all leading us up to what, what is the better way? What is the way yeah. you've you've figured out how to overcome this barrier here that all these other guys and God bless by the way God bless the Phoenixes and the other ones for convincing people that that consulting business is like a real thing <laughs> uh, that should be invested in or pursued. Uh, no, no, look, I I'm not trying to slag anybody, but if you can make a dollar in this space because of how complex and backwards it is, you know, all power to you, but doesn't seem like the right scalable place for this in my opinion yeah. you know, what do I know what do I know they're they're just kind of approaching the the problem from a fundamentally different direction than than we are at tilt so from you know these pay back in a box providers position their view is that every one of these software companies should be a fully registered payment facilitator and you know in my experience I just don't believe that most of these software companies actually want to be they, fully registered payment or need facilitators. to no, or need to. I, I think they want the benefits of the payback model, which is the instant digital onboarding experience and you know a nice revenue stream off of your payments. But the question is, what's the best way to get there? In my opinion, the best way to to accomplish those things and get the benefits of the payback model is through what we call payback as a service. And so the idea is that you can come to to Tilled and you can launch in a couple of weeks, not six months. You don't have to hire any new employees. You don't, you don't have to take on any additional liability. You just plug into our APIs and SDKs and let us handle all of the complex you know, back office operations, the underwriting, the fraud monitoring, the compliance, the things that you know, add overhead and risk and cost uh, you know, to, the, to the business. 
But the kicker is that we're still paying the lion's share of the revenue to the software company. And I think that's really the, the beauty of the Boom. model is that we're giving them, you know, the turnkey solution where they're still making the lion's share of the revenue on all the payments that are, you know, processing through their platform. Which is really, at the end of the day, isn't that beyond all this other table stakes, instant onboarding, and everything, isn't the revenue piece the big nugget here that's been the blocker? And that's what where Stripe is massively greedy and won't give you a cent. It, it, it's a big one. So, you know, if you're doing, you know, $100 million in, in payments, going back to that, that dental software, you know, example from, from earlier in the conversation, that's, you know, if there's, let's say, 80 basis points of margin. If the dentist is paying, you know, 2.9% and 30 cents, Stripe yeah. was making 80 basis points. <laughs> so $800,000 a year, you know, in profit on, yeah, on all that's those like transactions. For that, and that just, I guess, for the listeners too, that are less familiar, which that, I guess that probably on the average in the industry, it's probably like three to four X the average of the industry, right? In terms of basis point margin, in my experience. Yeah. So like on the, on the like traditional ISO side of the business, you're right, kind of 20 to 30 basis points is more the the average that we would see, you know, on those like brick and mortar accounts that that, that sure. we're signing. And so, you know, this idea of making 80, 100, 120 basis points is um, it's pretty uncommon, you know, outside of the the software space. But, you know, it's it's really the norm that, that we're seeing with a lot of these ISVs where they're they're adding a lot of value on top of just payments. And so they're able to justify a higher price point you know, for the, the payment services, because they're not just coming in and providing, you know, a terminal uh, to process the payments, they're adding, you know, scheduling tools and, and invoicing and reconciliation. And there, there's a lot of value out on top of just the, the payments element of their of their software. Yep, yep. That That's what we're doing here at like a Finexio on that outbound payment side too, right? It's like, hey, the payments itself is a commodity. But, you know, we can make over 200 basis points here because we're doing all the high touch value add program management turnkey support to get these software companies to embed payments in the door. And that's where, hey, we'll, 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 we'll be able to share that with you and drive the top line together, which is what if you're smart and you're an investor, your business and if you're a software company and you're trying to do payments and revenue, it's all about top line growth right now. Yeah, no, it is. And I mean, there, there's a lot of, you know, benefits to, you know, being able to, to add this ad additional revenue stream, you know, into your business. I mean, th think about the, the benefit from a, from a valuation perspective. You know, if you've got these, you know, 700 locations and you're making, you know, $100 a month on your, on your SaaS fee, what if you could add $100 or $200 a month in revenue through, you know, payment processing revenue? All of a sudden you're doubling or tripling, you know, your average revenue, you know, per unit on all of the the locations that that you've signed up. And I mean, that's tremendously, uh, you know, beneficial to not only your bottom line but your valuation. If you're fundraising or if you're looking to to exit the business, you know, investors are are really, you know, wise to the the benefits of of having this recurring revenue stream, you know, that you can you can get from from payments. Yep. Let's let's. I don't want you to share certainly your secret sauce, but I mean, what is it that you're doing differently here around making this so easy that you can take advantage? Because this is something we've looked at even at our company, and I think you and I will find interesting ways to work together here as we both grow our respective firms. Is that you know you can't even offer the credit card processing because a you can't get any of the you can't get the revenue. It's not worth your time and effort. That's been a big blocker always for us. B the only other way you can do it is via referral or doing a handoff and going through that paper form PDF situation, which also is a disaster. So surprise, surprise here at Finexio, even though we're talking to thousands and thousands of merchants a year, we find limited success with credit card processing. It's not our core focus. We don't find the success because of the pricing and because of the high friction. And there's not a turnkey offering, but Knowing, you know, I'm really close with the founders of WePay. Where I, I have no, I get in touch with every, anyone we want to get to. The bottom line and why we got connected is there's no real offerings out there. And so, what is the thing that you're doing that you've overcome to make this simpler that the market needs to really know about that you're addressing? Is it that just the banks suck and these big companies suck? Is it 
They just don't <laughs> want to because there's so much money on the tape. They, you know, they want to make it impossible. I don't, you know, maybe it's a combination of things, but I'd love to hear what, if uh, to the extent you can share, what is the approach you're doing here that is the kind of the aha? Yeah, no, certainly happy to, to share. And so, you know, from my perspective, it's a combination of, of technology, you know, business model, but also our, our back end partnerships. And when you think about, you know, the technology side of this, uh, we spent almost two years building out the, the core APIs and the core platform before we ever processed our, our first transaction. So I think, you know, you, you can't kind of understate how difficult it is yeah. to, to build out, you know, this type of, of, of technology. And, you know, the thought of spending, you know, two years before you're ever generating any revenue and, you know, ever processing, you know, any transactions is, is kind of hard to, to, to fathom. Um, do you, do you have, and forgive me, do you have outside investors or did you self-fund this thing just as a side note? It was primarily self-funded to get to the point where it was operational. And then we brought in uh, an outside uh, seed funding round last November. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we've got some exciting announcements coming soon. Um, nice, that, nice. That we'll be announcing here Good shortly you. on, the, on, well, the, on well, the fundraising side. No, that's great. We're uh, we're rooting for your success there. Obviously, I think it's a be a no brainer based on what we're learning. Um, but where I was just going to say, I'm very sympathetic with you. Is um, and I probably didn't didn't do myself a favor earlier on. I thought you'd be would be out of the gate faster. But I think in the payment space, it is fairly capital and time intensive, and it takes multiple years of investment and funding and development to get a robust platform and system before you can even move dollar one mm -hmm. because we're in the business of trust and safety and high repeatability, right? And we have to get the dollars to the right place most of the time, you know, barring some <laughs> various things that might happen. My business is a little bit different than yours. We're dealing with paper checks and the USPS and all sorts of randomness that can occur. But, you know, long story short, you, we're in the business of moving money, you and I, and uh, the investors really need to have the patience and wherewithal to understand that a lot of time and energy has to go in up front. You can't just like flip a switch and all of a sudden it's like magic beans here. So yeah, no, I, I, I think I you raise an important think, point, you know? It's it's tough. And, you know, the, the reality is it wasn't a problem that you could just solve with technology. And I, and I think that's probably been the, yeah. the almost the bigger roadblock to, to preventing someone from attacking, you know, the model that the way that we have is that not only did we have to spend, you know, all this time and money building out this, this, you know, really elegant technology, but we also had to go convince, you know, banks and, and processors uh, of this new model yeah. and this, this new kind of underwriting methodology and, and flow of funds. And, you can imagine as you know a startup with no balance sheet and no website and no pitch deck and a small team like going to a very you know, ten billion dollar very hard to do. They're not exactly thrilled, uh, you know, when you tell them, "Hey, it's no. going to cost you time and money, uh, you know, to go build out, uh, you know, the solution and and work with us." Um, and for us, you know, it took over a year uh, to to get those partnerships in in place and the yep. the risk that that I took was like building the technology without any of the, the partnerships uh, in place. And, and it was really this, that's what you have to do, kind of, you know, almost blind faith that like, of course I'm going to find, you know, find a way to, to make this work. Uh, but you know, you can imagine during that year, there were points in time where it's like, we're spending a lot of money on, you know, developers, you know, building this thing out. And like, we still didn't have any of the, the back end arrangements, um, you know, in place. One of the things I, uh, in my early days, uh, and I've given this advice on other, uh, probably a podcast or two, is I said kind of the feeling of do, doing what you're described, because I've done exactly what you had to do, and it is miserable and painful and uh, a lot of sleepless nights. I say it's kind of like, you know, you're getting punched in the face a hundred times, you know, like <laughs> over and over again, and you just have to keep plodding forward. And it's like, is that bank or is that big processor going to partner with me so I can go and do this, you know? Um, so kudos to you, but I, I don't think what the market understands and investors certainly is the tremendous, tremendous barrier to entry that these businesses have payments is a big business. There's a reason why there's like five big companies or 10 big companies and only just a few public companies in these spaces. 
it is incredibly difficult to break into these businesses. And you have to have not only the smarts, you have to have really good technology and everything, but it's about knowledge. It's the knowledge and the relationships and you cannot replicate that. And it's like, oh, why can't PayPal start? Caleb, why can't PayPal do this tomorrow? You know, why, yeah, why, uh, why, Google, why hasn't Tesis done it? Why, hasn't, why isn't Google data? doing this? Yeah. Isn't, can't Google just take all your business or PayPal? I, I've read about PayPal. Don't they do payments? It's it's hard, man. And, and I think, you know, when when we were fundraising, that was, you know, a question that, that came up pretty often is like, you know, why why doesn't, you know, Fiserv and FIS and Tesis and, and First Data, you know, offer these these types of solutions? And the, the reality is... They, yeah, it's it's hard. Um, and, you know, for a lot of these big institutions, they have the price point to make it interesting. But the the actual yes. like practical reality of building technology that's easy to implement and easy to work with is just not just not in their DNA. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, come and implement our API in two weeks. No way. It's never going to happen uh, unless they you got, know, buy somebody like got a Kind of like a semi- no, they've got like a semi-unionized employee base as well is the issue at some of these companies, you know? So that's the biggest thing is in payments, like anything else, you're dealing with people. And if there's no incentive for these people to move and do some innovation with a cool startup around some new business idea, that's there. Why, why are they going to work on it? Right? Just no, I, I agree. And, you know, touching on that kind of barrier of entry point, you know, the conversations that I was always having with these guys was like, oh, come back to us when you've got a billion dollars in volume. It's like everybody Absolutely. wants to talk to you when you've got a billion dollars in volume, but Come it's like when you, you don't know, need my help. Yeah, exactly. Come uh, back when you don't. Hey, I'd love to give you money. Come back when uh, you don't need my money and I'd love to give you some. Yeah. How does that sound to you, Caleb? Sounds great. Yeah. Whatever we don't need the help, I'll, I'll gladly come back and, and ask for some help. Absolutely. <laughs> love that. So that, that's what we were faced with. And so a lot, a lot of fun conversations, um, but, you know, obviously eventually figured out, you know, the, the recipe, um, you know, and brought it all, brought it all together. <laughs> yeah, to totally. So now this is really, um, uh, can be your, what you're really enabling, I guess, to paraphrase is you're now creating a new, a real revenue strategy for these businesses and to create some, real differentiation and flexibility for these software companies to provide payments without exactly becoming a payments company themselves is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Our, our core vision is to help software companies monetize their payments. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Like that's the, 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 that's well, the vision for the business. It, it's not just that it's, it's to monetize the payments of their customers, right? Correct. Correct. Which is, that's the tough part. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and how can they think about it? Not to, define your company for you, but how can they think about it as to your point, it is their payments. They're enabling those payments, right? Your partners, your software firms are enabling and creating those payments. How can you do a well, better job? They're selling with the it? customers. You know, they're they're bringing the opportunities to the table. They're signing up the businesses. They've written the software. Like they're they're really providing, you know, the lion's share of the the value. And so in my opinion, they should be earning the lion's share of the revenue, you know, on all of the payments that that are ultimately flowing through their their software system. Yep. Yep. Um, so is there a sweet spot for this now in terms of SaaS and, and specific verticals where you're excited about payments or integrated payments is one word for this, or maybe embedded finance is a kind of a buzzword that this kind of touches on. Every, where are you, what are you excited about in terms of these SaaS kinds of companies and partners are going after or other big kind mm -hmm. of plays here? Yeah, the way the way that I think about the the market, there there's kind of three chunks to the market. There's like zero to fifty million dollars in annual processing volume. There's this middle segment that that's like fifty million to about two billion in annual payments volume, and then there's companies that are processing north of of two billion dollars. And in that zero to fifty million dollar you know a year uh, segment, Stripe and Braintree are really the the dominant solutions. You know, those are the startups that are getting started. They're finding product market fit. Um, and paying 2.9 percent and 30 cents is, you know, frustrating. But it's not it's not going to kill the business, and, and you could probably get started, you know, with those platforms. And then kind of north of of two billion, that's where you know I really feel like these pay back in a box, you know, providers have their 
um, you know, sweet spot for the companies that want to become fully registered uh, payment facilitators. And, and I put that caveat in there because for a lot of uh, businesses, it doesn't really matter how much volume they're processing. They, they don't really ever want to become, you know, a fully registered, uh, you know, payment facilitator. And we've got clients, you know, processing well north of, you know, $2 billion that just don't want, you know, to ever become a fully registered payment facilitator. And so for us, you know, we really view the sweet spot in this middle segment, in this kind of 50 million to 2 billion, you know, segment of the, the market that, that I call the payback wasteland. Because pre-tilled, there really wasn't a great solution for these clients in this middle segment of the market. And so they were turning to, you know, the legacy processors, the TSIS, the First Data, the Card Connect, the Elevon, all of these guys that have, you know, what I would consider antiquated solutions that are difficult to integrate into. They have, you know, pretty painful boarding practices, and it's really just not, you know, a great setup. And so for us, we've really, you know, concentrated on this middle segment of the market where you have, you know, enough payments uh, volume to make it a substantial revenue stream, you know, for, for the business. And it really doesn't make sense for you to become a fully registered payment facilitator because you can actually generate more revenue working with Till. Uh, just the point was you can make more money with Tilled. <laughs> that, That's that was, the answer. That was the summation. Yeah. <laughs> that Beautiful. No, no. I think we got it loud and clear there. But what, was there a specific, uh, you talked about the horizontal. Is there any verticals you like or you think specifically for payments and and embedded payments and kind of helping? Is there any 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 reason around vertical? We talked a lot about medical uh, which I'm interested yeah. to talk with you further on, but any other spaces you found success around payments and needs around, you know, payment consumption and having it embedded in the software? I, I think one of the the really interesting trends that that we're really you know writing here at, at Till is just this verticalization of of payments, where you know historically the the big processors served you know every vertical and they were really the the only game in town. You know, if you go back. 10, 15 years, there was no one like Toast or, or Mind Body, you know, in the space that that had created these, you know, vertical specific niche, you know, software businesses. And kind of fast forward to today, where seemingly in every vertical, whether it's barber shops or you know, uh, pool maintenance software or rent collection software or nonprofits or healthcare or whatever the vertical is, like you can pretty much find, you know, a a software that's tailor made for you know that type of, of vertical. And, you know, at Tilled, we're, we're really looking at almost any vertical that we would consider kind of low or medium risk. So we're not getting into, you know, cannabis and CBD and some of the higher risk businesses. But within the, the kind of low and, and medium risk sectors, you know, we're, we're working with clients across, you know, a pretty diverse, you know, group of, of verticals. And the, the economics are pretty similar, you know, across all of these verticals where there's, there's money to be made. And in some cases, you know, more money to be made in payments than even on, you know, the core of their, their business. Understood. Um, it, uh, it, little side note, who, I mean, we talk about and, and uniformly agree that literally everyone sucks and don't work with them. They make it impossible. Um, and that really is the situation for the listeners to understand. I'm not even in your business. I'm not in the credit card processing side. It is miserable. The industry sucks. It makes it impossible. So good on you for doing what you're doing. Um, very sympathetic. It is, it is shockingly bad, shockingly bad. Who is the, who is the best of the worst? If any, is it just, is it Stripe or Braintree? I mean, cause they, they are good. Stripe and Braintree are good. I think they've made it so easy. They're just taking everybody to the tool shed and taking all their money and no one else has been able to figure out an alternative. That's why just for people that don't know, that's the situation. And they're just yeah. so much better than the other jokers out there, which is literally everybody else that they're just dominating. And that's why Stripe's worth $93 billion because they're the only ones. They've got a couple millennials there that just figured it out that are just modern that use mobile phones. Right. But people like me and you, that's the answer. Um, but is there a best of the worst out there? I, I would say that Stripe is probably the, the company that we get the most positive feedback uh, sure. from customers that are looking to leave, but are saying, yeah, we've loved Stripe. You know, the technology is fantastic. We've had a great experience, but like, sure, it's just expensive. And so, so expensive. you know, their their technology is so good that they have you know, this cult following 
amongst, you know, the, the startup crowd. And I understand it, you know, quite frankly, like we, we send, you know, some of the smaller customers that, that come in to, to till, you know, we occasionally recommend Stripe, you know, to some of these guys where it's like, Hey, you should go use Stripe, you know, for the next six, 12 months and then circle back to us, you know, when you have that, that product market fit, you know, and enough customers to, to right. justify, yeah. you know, coming on board uh, with till. Exactly. The thing is, everyone out of the gate wants to be a player and thinks they want to be able to keep all the interchange and do all the stuff, right? And that's where uh, Stripe, I think, does a really good job of coming in and say, look, we're going to give you something, it's going to work. And you can feel that good good about it. I think that's what they're that's what they're good at. Yeah, well, and I, I think as well, Stripe has a lot of like pre-built uh, UI elements where you don't have to build out your invoice or you don't have to build out your right. checkout page and some of these They're things. They're in the program like, management business. Yeah. They've got the so assets. Like, as a startup, you know, they have these assets that, you know, if you want to launch your business in two days, yeah, go to Stripe and plug in their, their pre-built, you know, onboarding form and their pre-built, yeah. uh, you know, checkout tool. And, you know, it all works pretty well. But like, as you scale up your business and you've got a team of, you know, 10 developers saving that, you know, week or two uh, that you get by, you know, using the pre-built Stripe elements is really no longer an advantage and, and arguably it's a real disadvantage. And, and I think a lot of the clients that come to Tilled are excited about our API first approach where they have the flexibility to build what they want and make it look like their brand, their look, their feel. And they don't have to compromise on, yeah. well, hey, this is what Stripe has and there's, you know, limited, uh, you know, configurability to, you know, their pre-built UI templates. Yep. Yep. So here at Finexio to just kind of uh, take, to switch it over here for listeners is like, we're doing this, the strategy of Tilde and Stripe, right? So we've got the program management, the websites, the portals, the landing pages, and just give it to you and you can white label it and take it and do whatever you like, you know, and go and run with it and use our API for backend outbound payments. Or for the more sophisticated customers and you want to get more of the revenue and do other things, you can come and just use our API, right? And we've done that with a company uh, uh, called Veeam. Their CEO, Marwan's a buddy. He'll be on the podcast here soon where that worked great for them. They've got a lot of volume. They've got the front end. They know what they're doing. They just needed a really solid API for US domestic Mm -hmm. B2B payments, right? Somebody else, your prototypical customer, they don't know what they're doing. That's where you need the Stripe-like assets and other of these turnkey things. And we realized that this was a big gap in the market. So um, we're kind of, AP is so different and so much more of a backwater than your space, which is now so much more developed that we have to actually do both models because the customers are at so many weird different spectrums of the of the sphere here. It's it's amazing. Well, um, but you guys a you lot of flexibility. It. it gives you a lot of flexibility to sign up the smaller clients as well as you know, the larger clients by having that, you know, diverse product offering. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so uh, where to go, where to go from here? We've covered a lot of ground. Um, you know, are, was there anything you wanted to touch on that we did not on, you know, um, some of the, some of these kind of core concepts we've touched on and differentiators and otherwise, because if, if, if there's anything you don't think that was important around um, just some of these key concepts that we've been kind of exploring and having a good convo on. I'd love to talk to you about any of your views on B2B payments. Um, yeah, and some I, of I that think we've post, covered but... pretty good ground so far. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you. No, I, I'm just curious. Do you, do, you, is there, do you have clients that are doing B2B payments? Do you see, um, you mentioned B2B to C. Is so much of this consumer to business? Do you see any use cases in B2B? Have you thought through any of that? Um, are there customers coming to you? I'd love to just hear where you see integrated pay- payments and receivables and payables around B two B, which is kind of my home. Uh, and I, I can sure I can jive off whatever you share on based on what we're seeing in the market as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think COVID in general has been just an accelerant on you know a lot of the the trends that were happening you know, pre pre COVID where, you know, businesses that were historically, you know, paper check, uh, you know, processes are, are trying to find ways, you know, to, to digitize their, their payments. And, you know, one of the things that, that we, you know, quickly, you know, adapted to at, at Tilled was offering ACH as an additional, you know, payment method within our, our API. Yeah. 
um, you know, when we launched, it was just credit cards and we had, you know, it was like the first 40 customers that, that we talked to, there were probably eight or 10, you know, that just needed ACH and like without ACH processing, like we just wouldn't win those deals. And, you know, I guess that was a, a miss on my part, you know, not, not, um, you know, understanding yeah. the, the needs of the, the customers, you know, well enough, but we were able yep. to, to get that integrated pretty quickly and, and, and just to know, pause there for, that's that's really i want to just ask you the reason there just to make sure i understand but listeners understand too is that really card although you can make great money on the card payments is still only a portion of your customer's revenue stream or payment stream i should say right in transactions so what you're talking about is you've had to be nimble during covid to say we've got to help support these customers we've got to think more about holistically their payment flows so we're going to integrate and offer more payment methods, in your case, more ways to receive payment and do business and transact because more business is moving digital. But that's really what you're saying, right? We need to we need to think as we're not just a card payment company. We need to put on our solve a problem for a CFO and more like how do we expand the aperture of facilitating multiple types of payments? Is that yeah, what you're saying? 100%. And especially in B2B payments that are oftentimes much larger you know, dollar amounts and, and tickets than in consumer payments, when you're paying a $10,000 invoice, the cost, you know, of the credit card uh, processing fees relative to ACH can be a pretty large difference. Uh, and so for a lot of these, you'll you know, take it if you can get it. Though. No, for sure. And, and I think people are willing to pay the credit card processing fees in a lot of instances, but they really want to offer that multiple methods of payment to try and encourage that lower cost of, of payment acceptance uh, by paying sure. with, with ACH. And so, you know, what we've seen some platforms right. do is like pass along a convenience fee for paying by credit card, but it's free to pay by ACH. And so when you go to pay that, that invoice, it pops up with the two options and you can pay, you know, 40 bucks or whatever it is to pay by credit card, or it's free, you know, to pay by ACH just as a way to encourage you know, the, the end user, whether it's a business or a consumer to, to use that, you know, lower cost uh, method. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, two things to, to touch, to tease on here, I think one, uh, as you may or may not r recall, I uh, really grew up in this space at, at working at MasterCard. And the answer was, and, and is always the card that that's that, the best way to pay. That's now evolved as they've evolved. Their strategy as a multi-rail company, um, a senior executive and EVP at MasterCard is on our board of directors. And we've got a close working relationship with MasterCard as a customer. So think very highly of them. But one of the things I find myself having to explain is why card is such a good option. And why merchants and suppliers see card is so valuable and why buyers want to use card. Given that you're on the other side of the transaction, I'd love to hear in your own words, uh, what, what do you see as the core value proposition and key benefits of card? And why are people willing to pay so much money for these card transactions? That's something that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about. I'm sure you've had to tell that story to investors. And I constantly shake my head and say, you fools, you don't understand how valuable this product is and some of the key challenges. But I'd love to love to hear from you from where you sit. Why do you why do you think it's an important product? Yeah. And, and, and what, I problem, think, what problems is it solving, I guess, or what are the benefits? I, I think for business owners, uh, some of the the allures of, you know, taking the, the credit card payments for one you're meeting the customers where they want to pay. Uh, and so from a, from a consumer perspective, you know, they get their points or their rewards or their cash back, you know, by, by paying with credit card, but they also have more consumer protection from a, from a chargeback perspective uh, to ensure that, you know, the business owner is kind of hold up, you know, their end of the, the bargain. Um, and so I think that, so that's, that's like a safety and a fraud, right? You're paying for peace of mind, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think that's one element of it. The other is for, from a business owner's perspective, you know, if you're checking out on, you know, an e-commerce store to pay for, you know, shoes, uh, if you're paying by credit card, you instantly know if, you know, that card has, you know, available funds and you place a hold, 
you know, on the on the account. And from a from a business owner's perspective, you know, okay, the 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 funds are good. You know, that money is going to come to to me, and you can do all of that instantly. Whereas the way that ACH is set up today, there's this huge lag in in the kind of authorization and approval and movement of funds. And for a business owner, Super you can either take the risk and say, oh, well, you know, Plaid told me, you know, that they had money today. So when I go and pull that money, you know, later today or tomorrow, it should be there. Um, but you're taking that risk that, you know, the money was there when they authorized the transaction, but then they pull all the money out <laughs> and you've already sent the goods. And so there, there's this disconnect between the, the kind of time of transaction and the, the time of the, the money movement, which in my opinion is like one of the big issues with ACH today, which I think, you know, with, with like push the card and RTP type solutions, they're trying to find ways to, to solve for, you know, some of those big gaps, you know, within ACH today, which yeah. I think prevents it from being a more dominant, you know, payment method, um, you know, especially in more, more consumer transactions. Sure. Uh, but in B2B as well, right? If it takes three days to settle, you know, just a long I time. Mean, that's one of the things about checks that that's one of the things about checks, why checks suck so much. Not only are they expensive and you need to use a human being to get them out there is you got a piece of paper in the mail. If the USPS <laughs> gets it to you in this day and yeah. age, that is, it's that is a dice. It's questionable. It is absolutely questionable it's a piece of paper and you don't know if there's money backing it. Would you mm -hmm. really want somebody to send you a piece of paper? You don't know if there's going to be good funds behind it or not. Is that really what you want? You're not willing to pay to make sure you're getting your money. It's just inconvenient. You know, I, I mean, I, I think that's kind of the, the biggest reason why cards are so dominant is that it's convenient and people are willing for to everyone. pay that price. That's for the convenience. thing. It's yeah, convenient for buyer and, and seller. Totally agree. Big time. And I think you touched on, I mean, I, I, again, I don't think most people realize how much ACH sucks and is a garbage product. And there's a reason it's super cheap. And it's like, oh, oh hey, good. it's like only like 10 <laughs> cents. It's only like 10 or 15 cents. Okay, great. Why isn't it 100% adoption? Why are there still 12 trillion B2B checks? Why are there still trillions of consumer checks? It's because ACH sucks. Nobody likes ACH as a secret. It's a garbage product. There's just a lot of drawbacks, uh, you know, and I think, you know, we're, we're trying to make ACH better and, you know, a lot, a lot sure. of these, you know, uh, solutions are trying to make ACH better, but you can't solve the just fundamental flaws, you know, yeah. with the, with yeah. the approach. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, that, that as, you know, RTP and some of these other, you know, faster money movement methods, you know, start becoming more, more mainstream, it helps and it encourages, you know, wider adoption. Um, well, yeah. right, right now there's just a lot of problems with ACH. You don't see the real time payment thing, uh, making any major impact anytime soon from where you sit. That's what it sounds like. It's a nice idea. I, nice concept. I yeah. Mean, I'm hopeful, but I'm not optimistic. I think it's probably the best way to sum it up. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I've had conversations like, oh, RTP, we're going to make all our money in real time or real time payments are going to just kill the cards. And you're like, mm, not unless it solves all the benefits we talked about, the security and the guarantee element and the chargeback protection, the fraud, all this other element that consumer convenience or payer convenience factor and they solve the size limits and you get all the new banks on a new platform and all this other fun stuff. It, it's like, I hope I'm retired by the time RTP is out <laughs> there and all this stuff. That's, I think that's where we'll be candidly. I, Cause I, last time I checked the banks move at a certain pace, which is um, like a melting glacier or a moving glacier. That's, you know, so to believe that RTP suddenly is going to come and kill and change all these other things you have to believe that there's this fundamental step change difference in the way that massive financial institutions move and roll out new things. That just Which is, it's just a, never going to change. Opportunity. Hey, there's an opportunity. Oh, they'll just, oh, they're going to do it. Obviously, they're just going to do it. It's all just going to roll out. Right? Of course. Jamie Dimon, well, he's going to be there. He's going to be pushing the car. He's going to be pushing the, the tray right over the, you know, it's like, no, no. He's going to be counting his money. He's going to be counting his money. 
looking at the cash in the accounts as these funds take three days to clear and they're collecting their float and they're very happy. That's what he's going to do. So people forget how banks make money. Is the fun? Is the kind of comical just thing? Fundamentally, just sitting on sitting on your money. Fundamentally, banks want to sit on money. Fundamentally, so um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to get my head around modern economic theory, modern monetary theory, which in this zero interest rate world, banks do have to figure out how to move things differently and make money differently, especially with all the spending plans and everything we're doing. You know, um, having said that. How much money could you charge for a real-time payment that's going to offset the in- zero interest rate environment world? You can't charge enough, and people are not no. going to pay. The problem with businesses and payments, right, is like the next new thing comes out, they're not willing to pay 10x more. Right? Oh, because- I, I agree. I mean, I, I remember when we, when we I, I say, basically tried to launch instant payouts for merchants. This was like, I don't know, I guess it was maybe like four or five years ago. And it was like one percent was the the cost, uh, you know, yeah. to get it an instant yeah. payout. And the the yeah. business owners are like, so I could get my money right now, and it would cost me one percent, or I could wait until tomorrow morning, and it would be free. And we're like, <laughs> yeah. They're like, I'm okay. Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, they're good. That's that they they actually uh, passed remedial math. Yeah. They, like, they made that it doesn't, through grade that school. That doesn't so that's seem good. to make sense to me. Yeah. Um, no, thank you. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's we, we started a supply chain finance business here and we went and raised about $15 million from a nice some nice people in New York City uh, to, so we could get payments like 30 days faster where you can charge about 1% to 2%. That's, that's where the market's at there, you know. That's, so, that's more reasonable than that's, like, 12 hours faster uh, exactly 30 percent more so the the payments industry has a ways to go and learning about uh how you know the time value of, of money works and how businesses perceive it but uh, that's the next big thing i believe and that's why we've we've ahead of the curve there uh in my opinion so check with me in a few years see if uh see if i'm an idiot or not we'll see you know i don't know the jury's out so um, but as, as our friend Wayne Gretzky says to go back to some Wayne Gretzky, you've got to skate to where the puck is. Didn't, didn't so. know that one. You didn't know. Oh, that's Wayne Gretzky's most famous quote, actually. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I know nothing about hockey or Wayne Gretzky other than he was in a Saturday morning cartoon series growing up with, uh, with Bo Jackson and, and Michael Jordan. Did you even know that was a thing? <laughs> No, I'm a few years older than you. There was literally a cartoon series where it was like the current sports stars of the day and age on Saturday morning nonsense cartoons after like Ninja Turtles. Wonder if that's on Amazon Prime. It may be. I, I'm an elder millennial, so I I have this like a weird analog kind of story set that I can pull out on you where I remember I had to get up to like change the TV manually, you know. Uh, and, but, but then I can also talk about Instagram and some other things to some reasonable degree of, I can, I it's passable. It's passable. <laughs> um, so g- I guess going forward, uh, you know, what, what's next for you in this industry? Where, where do you see Tilled really going? Payments, B2B payments. What's, what's kind of the next wave here? What's, what's next for your company? What are you stoked yeah, about? The- I think one of the, the the feature sets that I'm most excited about is our omni-channel solution. And so when I say omni-channel, historically, Tilled has been a, a card not present platform, helping people right. move money online, which is not great. Face-to-face, you know, during, right? Not on face-to-face. Um, but, you know, as the world is is opening back up for, you know, a lot of our customers, the vast majority of the money is actually moving, you know, in person. So like dental software, you know, as an example, the, the dental software company may only be collecting 25 to 30% of the actual revenue for that dentist because the dentist still has a terminal. So when you go to get your teeth clean, you know, you give them your, your credit card, you know, when you're in person to, to be able to, to take that payment. And so, you know, we're, we're pretty excited to be rolling out our, our omni-channel solution to be able to help these software businesses both handle the, the card not present payments, but also these in-person 
you know, physical payments, which you know, as the world opens back up, I, I just truly believe is going to be, you know, where the big growth, you know, opportunities are, uh, you know, both for Till, but also for, for our customers and, and their customers, uh, you know, to be able to solve that, that pain point as well. Yep. Yep. So, uh, you're going to be going to car- more card on file type businesses, consumer type businesses, and these kind of omni channel where you've got an online payment, but an in-person retail kind of payment. And, um, so yeah, the retail and, and the consumer face-to-face transactions are not going away anytime soon. Long story short. Certainly not. Certainly not. I know no. I'm ready to get out of the house and see people and travel and absolutely start some fun. no absolutely and our our uh one of our big uh verticals here is uh hospitality and hotels and uh we're seeing the spending pick up it's not quite at pre-covid levels it's still below so i have an enormous tailwind in my business here because of this some of our partnerships and hotels customers we've got but I was just on vacation, uh, which is weird. Uh, just like, oh, we're actually out in public with people. That's strange. And we were at um, we were at some we were at a resort uh, at lunch at another hotel, and I was shocked to hear the, they're like, oh yeah, we're at like ninety percent capacity. They're like, we've been busier than oh, we've yeah. been in years. Or like, people are coming from California and from Texas and all this stuff. And I'm like, that's great for the economy. This is awesome. Um, we'll still be dealing with this COVID stuff for some more time is the other side of the coin. Cause, uh, people are out and about and they'll keep spreading. But on the other side, people want to get out and spend and do business, you know, and, and folks are eager to do it. So I think good for your business, good for my business, obviously the spending is yeah. picking up. So we got in at the right time, I'd say. Yeah. We've had a couple of like hotel booking platforms and like short term rental platforms that have reached out to us because they're, they're just exploding. Yeah. Right now, where a lot of these guys, you know, had been hesitant to invest in any technology until they started to see the revenues pick back up. But, you know, as you said, it's it's really, really starting to to explode where people want to travel. They want to get out and about, and you know, the people that are getting vaccinated are are able to do that now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's so much cash sitting around because of folks that are traveling, especially for leisure, that they've just mm-hmm. been sitting on a pile of cash that's been growing and growing and growing in their personal bank accounts because they've not been able to spend it. <laughs> so, so, you know, you're not going out to a fancy dinner or taking your family to Disney World during a global disease state. No, nope. you're not. But the minute <laughs> you can, I'm pretty sure you will. Right. Along with everybody else on the planet. Those long lines at Disney and hot, the hot burning sun of Orlando will be there waiting for you with those high prices. It'll be right there. They'll be happy to wave you in. It actually sounds pretty good right now. <laughs> sure. Get, you'll get a Mickey Mouse ice cone or ice cream cone. <laughs> for $13. Uh, I'll t- uh, and, and that's a fair price. That's an absolute <laughs> fair price for that ice cream, for that nickel ice cream cone. Um, well, any other parting thoughts here or anything we didn't touch on that you want to sh- let our vi- our visitor, our listeners, I'm talking like I'm s- still working for the mouse here, our visitors, are any of our guests uh, here want to hear about anything we didn't touch on? It's been a great convo and, and uh, uh, we've touched on a real breadth of, of topics, I think, in, in detail where people will be like, how do these youngsters know about this stuff? I'm putting myself in that category. I don't even know how old you are, but let's consider ourselves the next generation here. Yeah, I, I think so. We're below 50. How about that? We're under 50 and that's, uh, that's figuring stuff gen. out. In this industry, it is. No, I agree. It's wonderful. What 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 else do we need to, what's any major point we need to get across here or, or parting shot across the bow, if you will? <laughs> Shots across the bow. I think I think we've taken, taken our, our fair shots uh, you know, at the, at the competition, but I, I really enjoyed the conversation today and really appreciate you having me on, on the podcast today. This was fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just by the way, for the listeners, where are you, where are you based? Where's your company based? Uh, I am based in Boulder, Colorado. And so our, our office, uh, is here in Boulder, Colorado, but as you can imagine with the the pandemic, we've been hiring really nationwide. Uh, and so now we've got, uh, employees in five states, uh, and right now we've got five open roles on the on the team across product, engineering, sales, marketing, support, and we're hiring nationwide. Um, we we really feel like we just want to get the best people 
you know, on the, the team, regardless of, of where they're located. But anyone that is in Boulder, Colorado, we do have a, a nice, nice little setup. Excellent. Excellent. Well, look, man, Caleb, great talking with you. Really fun conversation. I, I got smarter um, here to learn something and we got to each talk on some things we're passionate about. So uh, look, I'll be looking forward to tracking your growth, but more importantly, staying in touch and seeing if we can't work on a few things together. So um, thanks for your time, man. We'll be talking more soon. It was a, it was a lot of fun and informative. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, man. Talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Bye. See ya. Thanks for listening to B2B Cashflow Conversations. This is Ernest Rolfson, the CEO and founder of Finexio. I welcome your questions and comments. You can reach me at podcast at Finexio.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Finexio Payments. To subscribe, you can go to Finexio.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to check out my new episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Thanks and talk with you again soon.